hello again and uh, welcome to a new location as I'm sure you'll be able to tell I'm not at my desk back in England but um, across the Atlantic uh, in the United States I, honestly I, I the nature of these videos is just so sporadic that, that there's going to be no really <laughs> coherent or formal structure to any of it uh, so it's really just going to be a matter of doing things whenever I can find the time. But already I'm rambling, which is contrary to what I thought I wanted to uh, do. But I'm also waiting for the subject that I was going to speak about to come to mind, so give me a second. You can see my background's very uh, uh, academic in contrast with my, my last one because I've got all my condiments in the background. Uh, they're not all mine. I, uh, yeah, that would be a bit excessive. <laughs> um, but in any case, the the thing that that, that um, prompts me to 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 record a video is really a reflection on the nature of. So I say metaphor very broadly, and by way of a general thesis, I might say that language that we use, even when speaking literally, is always metaphorical, and concepts that we engage in intellectually and that we employ intellectually, and then above all and most intimately, simply uh, experience that we have, is all metaphorical in nature. And this may sound a bit strange because, of course, we're entirely accustomed to using the language of literality to describe things that are just here in the world. But if you do subscribe, and, and perhaps I need to be more systematic to try and persuade people to this uh, worldview elsewhere, but, but for now I'll, I'll speak on just this. If you do happen to subscribe to uh, a view of theism, broadly speaking, God is not just some sort of extraneous entity floating off in the void, sort of stroking his beard and thinking, you know, what should I do with creation today? Of course, creation is really not apart from God. It it's, exists only in, through, and by him. And so he is essentially the ineffable ground of creation pervading and permeating all things and transcending them as well, of course. Subsequently, it, it seems to follow logically that every time we're speaking of creation, which is of course everything that we experience, we're necessarily speaking of something that if it is true, so therefore precluding things like sin or suffering, it is a metaphor of sorts for God. And this is a fascinating idea in relation to uh, the thought of the various Christian theologians who speak in analogical terms, uh, of whom I'm taking a particular interest in John Scotus Eriugena at the moment for the sake of my senior thesis. And Eriugena, uh, following Pseudo Dionysus and Gregory of Nyssa, is very much concerned with the relationship between the apophatic and the cataphatic, which is to say, the negative and positive ways of speaking about God, describing God in accordance with what can be said, for example, that he is being itself as a cataphatic root. And then the apophatic is saying he is not being in the sense that he's not anything in creation. And the fact that one doesn't collapse into the other in the experience of creation is very, very important. I'm fascinating as well for precisely this reason. I, I was sort of prompted to, to and I, I, I'm sorry if I can't articulate my thoughts properly because this is really an idea I'm a bit excited about, but I'll think about it in... in uh, more fully in, in, in uh, due course. But again, so sort of accepting all the platonic uh, hierarchy of, of it all and accepting the sort of the real is God, essentially. When you have an aspect of reality of creation that is real, that reflects the real, so for example, love and experience of love, it's not like that's just some sort of pantheism that just like love that you have between a father and a son or between 
uh, two young uh, lovers in a romance or uh, between a, a grandmother and a granddaughter, whatever it may be, or love yourself, perhaps. How radical. Um, it's not the case that these things are God, right? We, we'd have to speak in, in rather pantheistic and ultimately sort of rather wishy-washy uh, neo-spiritual terms if we were trying to make that claim. But what's fascinating about them is they consistently display and reflect and serve, as I say, as metaphors for God and indicating an infinitude of love above and beyond this. And this is what's very interesting in relation to what I think is the essential schematic of religion in general, which is trying to point out that nothing in creation is God, no matter how good it may be. And it's only when you realise that, that you can sort of be liberated uh, into a joy which recognises the gratuity of all things. So to try and make sense of the, of the uh, great bricolage of, of nomenclature that I'm bringing together, I might give the example of because this is what prompted me to, to think about this. Uh, a father and son, for example. If you have a father whom you love very much, what you can't come to do is start to treat that father like they're infallible, like they're perfect, like there's nothing ever wrong with them, and they'll always fulfill your every paternal need and they'll always pave the way and they'll always know everything, right? It, it, it's sort of a strange thing that children go through is they recognize when they grow up, they have to treat their parents like gods because if you don't, you know, that's a pretty horrifying prospect for a young defenseless child is the idea that mummy and daddy are not gods is really life-threatening. You know, there's something quite Darwinian to it. You have to believe absolutely in your parents. Subsequently, a lot of children when they're growing up and they have parents mistreat them, they come to believe that the problem is not with the parents as, as, as it actually is, but they come to believe that the problem lies with them because they literally can't compute the idea that the parents could be at fault because that's the far more existentially horrifying idea that uh, the people who are protecting me, who have taught me everything I know, are not secure. You know, they're, they're children of their own ilk, of their own sort. That could be a scary thing. But it is a recognition that you must come to make through maturity. But what's fascinating is when you come to recognize this fact, you, you have peace beyond, right? Because it's interesting. You could either sort of collapse into nihilism, which says, okay, I want my political candidate, or I want my uh, husband or my wife, or I want my or not just people, you could say, I want my, any, as in desideratum, anything you desire, I want this career to make me complete. And, and you believe this and you hold it tightly, but then life comes along and reveals that these things aren't perfect and they're just contingent and they're conditioned. And dad himself was once a child and still carries all the psychological burdens of being a human being and isn't perfect. And for every pearl of wisdom he may have bestowed upon you, he got it from elsewhere. And, more to the point, he's still not perfect just because he knows it. So again, that can scare you, because it's like, okay, well, who's next? Who's, who's the next idol that I have to worship? Who can I, who can I cling to? Who's going who's gonna to make all things better? Who's going to uh, uh, chase away all, all the scary monsters and the ghosts? And so you might go from place to place, from person to person, from object of desire to object of desire, you could go, oh, well, I want money, and once I have all the money in the world, then I'll be happy, or and once I have all the women chasing me, or all the men chasing me, then I'll be happy. Once I uh, become the most powerful man in the world, then I'll be happy, you know, whatever it may be. Or once I have a perfect relationship with a perfect person, I meet my soulmate, then I'll be happy. But that's the nature of desire. Lacan pointed this out, although with a rather more pessimistic uh, structure behind it, because he believes that the real was really just a vacuity, uh, rather horrifying absence at the centre of our being from which we continually uh, defer and deflect our attention through these sort of rather superfluous and superficial desires. But you don't have to take Lacan's approach, you can be far more, and, and this is what I believe theology has to offer, you can be far more enriched 
by the recognition that no one is perfect and nothing will make you complete. And then you know that everything, to come back to the original point and hopefully conclude somewhat coherently, that everything in creation that is true, that you want, right, the desire truly takes you after, is only a metaphor for God. It's only a metaphor, it's only a symptom of something that you never really can quite face in itself. Hence, Ariugana's emphasis on the apophatic. You can never quite see God in his infinity, because if you did, it wouldn't be infinite anymore. His transcendence is, is one with his, uh, his boundlessness. So this comes back to the idea of, well, you know, technically then there's nothing. In the apophatic sense, you realise there is literally nothing in the world that will fill you up. And that sounds like the most horrifying thing ever, but Theism points out that the thing that will fill you up is not part of the world at all, because it's not a thing at all. And realising the latter bestows upon you the peace of the former. I'm sure I'll think of more to say on that, but it's... Just look, that's perhaps the metaphorical idea. Just look through your desires. See what actually is pure and what is good and what uh, gives an intimation of something greater. And whenever you get your desire or you don't get your desire and you come up miserable because you always want something more, take that as indication that the something more is not something ontic to be acquired amidst the manifold. Take that as an indication that what you're looking for Simultaneously, you will never get, and yet, you always already.